Sergeant family, friends and colleagues, it is a real pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Roger Sargent Lecture, the 28th Roger Sargent Lecture. What we hope to achieve uh, today is to celebrate the achievements of Roger Sargent and his contributions to the field of process systems engineering through the lecture, but also through a panel discussion which will hopefully st stimulate new uh, thoughts in this area. As many of you will know, uh, Roger Sargent was very keen on contributions to the fundamentals, but also contributions uh, to practice and transferring that th new th those new theories to practice. Tonight's lecturer is a fitting embodiment of his thinking. Uh, Professor Sandro Macchietto has spent his career in the area of process systems engineering, making novel contributions, but also pursuing their application to practice and industry. Sandro has made numerous contributions to the field. Uh, he has initiated new approaches in many areas, including uh, areas that I've used myself in uh, molecular design and uh, also in, in experiment design. But he's made generally contributions to simulation, control, optimization, and the design of processes. Sandro has also shown uh, immense leadership in his career. Uh, he was one of the founders of the Sargent Center and was its director. Uh, he also uh, was one of the founding members of the Energy Futures Lab at Imperial College, uh, and he initiated an MSc in Sustainable Energy Futures, showing his interests and, and uh, um, involvement in multidisciplinary teaching and research. He's also led some large projects, including the UniHeat project, a UK-Russia collaboration. Uh, focused on energy efficiency. In addition to his academic contributions, Sandro has uh, started up or been involved in starting up two companies, Process Systems Enterprise Limited and Excel. He was the uh, initial managing director of PSC Limited, now Systems Process Systems um, Engineering. Uh, Sandro's contributions have been recognized through a number of awards. Uh, the Queen's Award for Excellence, as well as the Queen's Award for Enterprise at Imperial and the Sargent Center and uh, at PSE. He's also uh, received a number of awards, including the MacRobert Award from the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK, which is the highest award for profitable innovation um, through his involvement with, with PSE. And he's been recognized also uh, in Italy where he was made a Cavaliere of the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic. So this is the foremost national order in Italy. Um, so it's really a pleasure to, to welcome Sandro here. Sandro today will be talking to us about data, models, knowledge, wisdom, what for. And uh, Sandro, over to you. I really look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Claire, for the nice introduction. You know, uh, uh, I'm very honored for the invitation. I mean, Roger Sargent uh, lecture is one of the, in, in, in my diary, is one of the top uh, you know, events of the year. And uh, um, it's a bit funny that we should meet all uh, uh, this way. Uh, it's usually a very convivial event uh, where we can you know, meet and share. And um, it's, it's not to happen. So I'm here in my office. Uh, staring at the screen. I hope that we find uh, very soon a time to uh, do it in a different way and have a drink together and so on. Uh, I would also take the opportunity for uh, um, paying my uh, tribute to Roger. It is is the reason uh, I'm here at Imperial. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, there were only two or three places around the world which were doing work on computer system engineering. And you know, this was the top of my list. And uh, the day I got an invitation, I felt uh, very emotional. I must say I came to London in October without great expectations about uh, you know, the weather and uh, you know, the food and so on. Finally, three splendid days of uh, great sun uh, and say, oh, well, after all, it's not too bad. So it, it has happened twice since. OK. Uh, without further ado, uh, let me say that um, I try to distill a few of the things that I've you know, come across my desk and things I've learned, usually by 
making mistakes. Um, I, I try not to have any single equations in my you know, presentation, um, but I think I will have to mention at least eigenvalues at least once. So uh, uh, the title uh, you know, is, is, is something which I'm, I really uh, uh, felt quite hard to live up to when I, I, I made the presentation having, having uh, done the uh, you know, a nice catchy title, uh, but I think you know in the current environment where there's a lot of uh, discussion about you know data models and what they all means and uh, how do you distill the uh, their significance. I think it may be quite appropriate, and I think would be followed by an interesting uh, discussion on uh, AI and all that. At the bottom are, are you know, why, what, and so what. This this is really the the three questions that, that I tell all my PhD students, you know, you really should ask and address those three questions. It's very simple. Why you're doing something, what you're doing, and after you've done it, so what? So I hope that by the end of this, I will met my own criteria. So process system engineering has kind of a wonderful uh, ambiguity, at least in the in English systems. Because you, know, you can you can look at it as uh, you know, the, the systems engineering of process, or you know, alternatively the engineering of process system. And indeed, the Roger Sargent gave a, a full you know, lecture at his CAST award you know, many years back on this ambiguity and the difference between the two and why you know you, you can actually embrace both things. In my view. You know, the, the systems engineering of process is what emphasizes the methods, the analysis aspect, uh, you know, using you know, data and models of whatever type, you know, to gain you know information and knowledge. But then you know that's this analysis bit is not really uh, you know complete for an for an engineer. It is not even you know, useful. Uh, you need to go all the way back and say, what do I do with this? What what is my purpose? What my intent? And then use the information you have to affect some changes, to design or implement some changes, to engineer the process system. So this is, you know, this is the synthesis you know, element, and the result of this is action. Of course, uh, you don't really see this as uh, as independent, and in fact, there is a, a a nice circularity to this because you do it once, and then you you learn something and do it again, and so on. And I will take this as a basis for my presentation. I, I think you know, if I had to summarize in one slide, this would be it. Um, and we'll come back a little bit in terms of what we actually mean by you know, process. Is it just you know, chemical processes or or what? Okay. So you know, the, the the question between you know, do I start from the data, do I start from the model? It seems to me this is really a chicken and egg situation. You start from wherever you are. And you go around the circle in the best way that you can, possibly more than once. Um, and this is the moment where, if you were all in a room, will be a little uh, you know, audience participation you know, challenge. Uh, I, I'll see how this works in a, in a remote, but uh, here it is. Okay, assuming we have uh, you know, a data, you know, x one. Uh, an, an experimental value for some value of x, you can get a y, and you have one data point. So let me ask you, uh, uh, what will be the value of y for for x2 at a different point? Okay, now I put my you know, audience hat, uh, hat on. Is it of course? You know, how can you ask me such a question? It is not possible to answer. Indeed, it is not. It is not in the absence of, uh, of any other information, but if you assume that, uh, you know, for example, you know that uh, uh, for a value of x is zero, you, you also have a value of y is zero. You know, this might be, I don't know, prices of, uh, uh, of, of flats or houses in, in your neighborhood. Uh, certainly if you don't buy any, the price is zero. And, and maybe in the first approximation, which is reasonable in many cases, uh, and it might be linear, then you can actually respond, you know, what is the value of uh, y at x2, okay? Uh, so this is very simple 
model, it's a linear model, as simple as it can be. Uh, and immediately one can see that uh, you know, the data and the model are, are worth more than, than either alone, because a linear model without any point will also be quite useless. So uh, here is slightly more thing. Now, now we have collected two models, two, two experimental points. You know, uh, what can we can we conclude with that? You know, is, is this you know, clearly a line? Well, two points define a line, and you can say, you know, yes, they are. But what is the uncertainty on those on those uh, 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 you know, measurements? Uh, Depends on many things, and be depending on um, size of floods, quality of the floods. If this is the price of floods, uh, in, in a process term, may depend on the quality of the sensor, how you carry on your pro your protocols, experimental, and so on. So, yeah, it, it is clear that there are many possible solutions there. So the uncertainty or the variance in the in the data is as important as the models that you have. So important that if the the measurement is uh, is really bad, uh, meaning the error is, is quite large. You, you actually lose information you know, at all. This could well represent a case where you know, Y does not depend on X at all. Uh, so uh, it's constant where there is a negative uh, um, you know, relationship or, or a positive in the ratio. So clearly the quality of the data uh, is fundamental to the quality of, of the models that you can do, or the analysis you can do. Uh, you get more experimental points, and uh, you may say, "Okay, I have different linear parameters, and so on." Yeah, okay, well, now that's a better, a better situation to be in. You can start to to do some discrimination: which data are linear uh, uh, and which not. Uh, is this all? Well, uh, you know, uh, you you may also consider: you know, is this in the range of what I want to explore, uh, and then we find that you know if you look at the entire range uh, of interest, these are points maybe so close there are practically just one point, and you learn absolutely nothing about what happens you know elsewhere, you know whether this is linear or not. This is actually rather more common that uh, 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 is uh, you you may think, for example. If you are a chemist, you will try to do all of your reaction in a way where the yield is maximum and collect all your data there. And if you try to develop a model for the kinetics, these data are, are really very, you know, very little use because they are all focused very near one point. And the other case, which is probably all, all of you have, uh, have some experience recently, um, if these are the early data from a COVID uh, uh, you know, pandemic, uh, all you think is really are things going up or things going down, but uh, uh, you know, maybe think they are linear, except that you will then you know neglect the you know the exponential to come in a short time. So uh, the one of the messages here is that you know, you may have data and uh, you know models that you do or the, you know, the way you look at the data, it really is not independent. Uh, it comes from filter from your own experience, comes filter from your point of view, come, comes filter from you know, a lot of background. You know, the cartoon here says uh, you know, this exactly the same data you know, seen by you know, different uh, angles, you know, where the politicians or the, the lawyer, and the interpretation of this data is very, very different. I must say, if an academic were to look at this data, you could say, I can see another grant here being necessary on machine learning uh, uh, AI. So uh, one of the corollaries which I you know, uh, found out over the, the year is that you know, nobody really believes a model except the modeler itself, himself or herself. And everybody believes the data except the experimenter who has developed them because he knows words and everything about the data. So uh, again, you know, the two go hand in hand. First, we really need what to do, what do we need model and data for? So the purpose is, is, is important. Uh, is it for a you know, local uh, fitting? Is it for extrapolation? Is it for you know, uh, planning? Is it for... Uh, and, and 
what kind of data do we need? You know, and, and then it says, what, what, what do we need to put in and what is the, is the outcome? If you leave out uh, work in a subspace, uh, of course, you may find that you know, additional things become uh, erratic noise uh, and, and you may not have a chance uh, at all. Let me give you two, two examples. One was uh, you know, very early on, and I think you, you really learn from your own mistakes. Uh, this first case is uh, it comes from one my first uh, MSc thesis, which I supervised together with Professor Sargent, Emilia Condili. You know, so looking at the dynamic model universe separation column. This is many moons ago, last century. So forgive me if, uh, if if things were still simple at that time. Uh, formulated all the uh, proper equations in the way that Professor Sargent was a uh, you know, very keen to for attention and, and all that formulated all the um, uh, proper balances and, and all that um, used the state of the art at that uh, at that time to solve that and the good news was it was really good convergence uh, to quite tight tolerances you know, the profiles uh, produced were very nice and very smooth so all looked good except and this was a very big except and here it was really professor sargent experience having worked with uh, uh, Lear liquide in france on this very problem for for several years said well these results look almost correct but i do not believe them they do not physically correct what's going on here and, and it tried and tried get to reproduce the same you know, results several times in the end, what turned out it was a, 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 an index problem with a, a, an index greater than one in the formulation. Uh, the type of solution was, uh, to some extent, accidental. It really depended on you know, either you know, initialization uh, condition or you know, various noises in, at the beginning of the of the uh, calculation. So. After that, there was a lot of work on you know, trying to understand the index problems, and indeed, it was uh, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, um, um, Costa Pantelidis, that you know, uh, did a, some really interesting work. And out of that uh, came some some really good understanding on uh, uh, of the problem and how to to solve this uh, higher index uh, problem, how to formulate nice problems. So. All data were good, all solutions were good, except it didn't really make you know, physical sense. The second example is from my own uh, experience. Again, you know, although most people know me as uh, having um, you know, done work in modeling, I, I actually did some experiments. Uh, 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 this from the work of PhD of Gaia Franceschini, uh, work on design of experiments. Uh, we built a reactor for try out the certification reactions. Uh, these are very difficult. There are three reactions going on, very similar in similar circumstances, very hard to detect. So we were using this as, a, as an example for uh, resolving uh, uh, identification using design of experiments. Uh, had very good reactor. Uh, Gaia was uh, very meticulous, so the measurement was very, very good. Uh, the variance was uh, very low, extremely reproducible, except again, you know, some of the profiles were very odd. In particular, there was a, sm a smooth uh, growth of one of the products, uh, which looked reasonable and as expected, except the first point in this growth was you know, off the line by miles. It was really, and, and it was, reproducible and you know, try many, many times and it had you know, very small variance. So a good data point. So is it is it the model? Is it something which is wrong? Is it, is it a reaction? There's something going on that we didn't know at the beginning. We really hit our uh, head against the wall for a long time until you know, she realized that um, the very first point collected uh, was collected in, in an environment where you know, were contaminated by the last point that was connected a high conversion in in the previous experiment. 
So we were you know, precisely observing something which we're not interested in it was a wrong thing. So again, a, a salutary lesson here. So uh, the, the, the chicken and egg situation is if you have some data, you know, what's the best model? Well, you know, we can reverse it. Said, you know, if I have a model, what data do I need in order to validate it with some within some desired confidence? Otherwise, you're going around forever. And we indeed did quite a lot of work on this you know, design experiment using model, quite sophisticated model, differential and algebraic equations as the basis, as the encapsulation of your best knowledge so far to formulate a problem. How, uh, how do I, you know, what kind of points do I need next? Uh, you know, and if you can automate the cycle, this, you know, you can call it a machine learning. And in fact, we try to do this in you know, one of my first PhD here at Imperial College, and I'm still working on it. So it's not a, a finished job. Uh, one aspect that you know, really bothered me on that is that how do you measure the quality of, of, of the information here? And this is classically done by, you know, if you have a set of data, you just uh, fit them and you have a, a confidence of the parameters. And if you are within a, 95% uh, in two dimensions is an ellipse, in a in multiple dimension in an ellipsoid, you are doing quite well. Okay, and there, uh, but you know, if you want to to make this the objective of your optimization for the next experiment, is actually quite difficult because uh, it's not a scalar. So it, you take some surrogates here, might be the uh, you know the volume of that ellipsoid or the uh, length of the axis or which are the eigenvalue and so on. What it turns out that uh, if you use this as a measure, you know, what I experience, everybody experience, you know, if you minimize that volume, you find that this, this volume is becomes highly stretched. Uh, and if you stretch it completely, it becomes uh, you know, volume zero. So, it, you know, is what you asked for. And that indeed what you what you get. Uh, so the, the resulting parameter are very often highly correlated, which is not good. Uh, for identification purposes and so on. And, and it took me 30 years to, to reflect on this until again, you know, the, the light bulb moment came We say, okay, you, you are really not on wanted minimum volume for that. You want nicely shaped and less correlated uh, uh, results. So the moment you and this, you know, this came to mind, say, okay, given that we had an op optimal control formulation of this, you know, we can actually add as a constraint that uh, the ratio of the longer uh, axis and the slowest action on that uh, ellipsoid there or some other uh, formulation of correlation should also be included. And the moment you do that, everything starts working perfectly and you get you know, lots of nice results, avoid a lot of, um, a lot of problem. And one of the frustration is that having, uh, I thought this was one of my best pieces of work, uh, having published this over 10, you know, 10 years ago, uh, uh, it seems like nobody's really picked it up. Um, and so I still read, you know, PhD thesis, including one yesterday uh, or the day before, uh, where, where um, this seems to uh, have not been taken up. So I don't know. Uh, my lessons, I, I hope that might be useful. The work in this are design of experiment is actually making now a lot of work because of the ability to process a lot of data. So, uh, and two directions which I'd like to you know, highlight here is the work that uh, Federico Galvanin at UCL uh, is doing on uh, completing the loop and closing the design experiment loon automate automating the whole entire analysis uh, at the work that uh, Benoit uh, Chahuat is doing in the in the center to introduce completely probabilistic uh, framework to the idea uh, much further than I we did at, at that time. Okay, so a uh, small thing: data driven versus uh, physics or model driven. You know, seems to be the subject of the you know, panel. Uh, clearly. Uh, uh, you cannot extract knowledge in, in a variety of ways. Um, for me, you know, the, the, the way of extracting data is really going through the loop more than once and asking all the right questions, what is wrong and so on. So that's, that's how you learn. But you know, uh, I, have, I start from a skeptical 
point of view, I must confess here, you know, on, on this uh, AI machine learning things. Uh, I ask myself, how many apples would you would you need to show, you know, falling to to look at falling? How many data points would you have before you you learn or you infer the theory of gravitation? And um, I, I'm not so sure that it would actually happen. So there is some additional input that has to come from somewhere else, all in addition to the data themselves. Nonetheless, you know, AI has had some you know, outstanding successes. Uh, some are mentioned there, you know, uh, inferring uh, uh, cancer from uh, scans or radiography. Uh, people tell me that uh, uh, jet fight battles uh, uh, are better performed by, by you know, AI uh, systems than the pilots themselves. I take it from a pinch of salt, becomes from a mini from a military person. But you no, know, there are clearly some some very good success. I must say again, uh, some of my own experience here. <laughs> uh, for good or for bad, a few years ago, I was invited to a to a, uh, a panel of experts to advise the science ministers at the G7 um, you know, meeting. Uh, and this was the impact and challenges of AI. Uh, yeah, and you, know, you put a few experts in, in or non-experts in, in the area, and you know everybody would have a you know heated discussion as usual. You know, the greater challenge here was to summarize all of this in in, in one page because apparently uh, science ministers' attention is is is, is uh, you know, doesn't go too far. So the chairman of the session, there, who was an expert in AI, said, "Okay, how about if I if we do this uh, and I have devised here an AI program uh, earlier to to search all you know, the known information about this? Yeah, we, we let this to do that." <laughs> I, I was smiling. Said, "Let's see what comes out." Indeed, what comes out was some something which are uh, remarkable, highlighting all the points there that. Um, in terms of uh, challenges of uh, 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 you know, data data protection, quality of the data, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, transparency, uh, privacy, you know, all, all that. Uh, and and I thought, yes, you know, the English was not so good, so I had something to to remark there. But then I, ha I started to say, well, how how is that? And in fact, this this uh, AI program was actually trolling, you know, hundreds and thousands of papers that the same people uh, in the room had actually written earlier. So it was not a different uh, interpretation. It was actually you know, an excellent organization and, and classification and uh, and, and uh, distillation, if you like. So what I ask myself is that what is really the key to you know, knowledge generation versus simply classification, interpretation, and interpolation? Or say surrogate models to interpret data that you have already, you know, generated, you know, the hard way. Is there any more to that? You know, maybe my colleagues, uh, hopefully my colleagues will will address it. But uh, I think more recently, I, I really uh, come to to understand that there's really a lot more to it. And this is the uh, application of all this, not just to you know playing chess, but to solving a really, really, really tough uh, problem here, which is the uh, identifying the and the conformation structure of proteins uh, from their amino acid you know, sequences, the, 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 the A, B, C, and D uh, um, you know, sequence of, of amino acid. Uh, and you know, this happened you know, in the last uh, few months. Uh, the, the alpha fold uh, uh, from uh, uh, your know, computer that uh, was able to uh, approximate uh, or to, to, to calculate uh, uh, very rapidly, a number of structures which are considered as correct by the scientists uh, that uh, have done it in a different hard way with great confidence. Uh, and it really enabled, you know, here's the comment of one of the experts that enabled me to do this in half an hour, what I failed to, to, to address in, to do in 10 years. So, you know, on the right side is indeed is the, uh, is the structure of the, you know, COVID-19, you know, uh, you know, protein there. Uh, it's not quite clear how they do it, but uh, what they say in the latest Nature paper is that the underpinning, you know, this 
version is a novel machine learning that combines and incorporates you know, you know, real physics about the protein structure, uh, multi-sequence alignments, and, and, and the deep learning algorithm. So I think that there is already, we are at the stage where you know, physics here is starting to have an impact and uh, it will be handled. So uh, in, my, in my mind, this is uh, you know, worth the Nobel Prize the same way that uh, you know, discovering uh, you know, DNA uh, sequences and, uh, and, and doing the genomes uh, uh, you know, were worth it. All of which happened in my lifetime. Uh, and in fact, uh, the, sequence, the genome sequences that took uh, you know, 10 years to, to do, you can do now just about on a, on your phone. Okay. A little bit back, data model knowledge action. You know, how much data, how much knowledge do I need to do in order to make sensible actions and go back and do some you know, realistic uh, you know, design or uh, or operation calculation, or indeed uh, you know, to take some uh, uh, some uh, you know, decision about uh, uh, you know, whether we should get locked down or not. And uh, let me give you an, an example here uh, about this you know, information we had during the early stages in COVID. You, know, you may remember, you know, uh, end of January, early February, two thousand and twenty. Uh, there were three things that uh, came back to me and uh, and I noted. The first day was the fairly long incubation uh, period without showing of any symptoms. The highly infective nature of this because people were dying and uh, so, so with a mortality rate estimated to be you know, one, two percent, if not higher. So you make a very quick uh, calculation you know, in the UK, 66 million. Uh, if only half of that, you know, get it uh, uh, is is you know, rounding down 30 millions. You know, uh, you got uh, you know one percent of that. You know, two percent is that you know hundreds of thousands of of, of that. Okay. Um, the other uh, um, the reaction I had is that ooh, we are in deep trouble here, big big trouble. Um, and the reason for that is very simple. You know, if you look at this like a, trying to control your temperature in your shower, you know, you're in your shower and you, know, you experience a little delay between the you know, knob and, 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 and the temperature. Now, you're here in a situation where uh, the, the, you don't even have a, a realistic uh, measure of temperature. You, know, you find out your temperature were in the hospital. Uh, the, 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 uh, the control of the uh, of the temperature, you know, rather than being you know, in the shower, is is two miles away, and that is delayed. Try to control that. All right. So you know that gives the case uh, for really worrying, especially given that in you know late December uh, 2019, I had been in China. And you know, early in January, and in fact, you know, early February, I have been to Milan and to you know, Veneto region of Italy, where everything was breaking out. So before you know anything happened, on the back of that, you know, as soon as I arrived, you know, home in in in, uh, in London, and I showed that uh, I seen that uh, uh, the scenes from uh, you know, Bergamo and so on. I locked myself in for you know two weeks and call all my people I knew that I had met. You know, please do the same. So this was evident from a small amount of data, uh, and you do not really need you know a lot of uh, 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 lot of data collection or, or, or more information to 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 have a sensible you know reaction. Of course, now we know a lot more. The I'll go very quickly now uh, over essentially the second part. Uh, throughout my you know, career, uh, and you have already you know, heard about some the frustration about some of the you know, key points we were not actually taken up. Uh, the process of innovation is is interesting, and I 
uh, I've always been very interested on how to you know, get stuff out, how to get people to use stuff, how to learn about uh, what is necessary. So the process of making changes. The traditional linear approach is, is, is on the left. Uh, you first do science, and then you do the patent, then you go out and look for money, and then you, uh, you know, sell it, and then you know, collect the benefits. At, at the but my experience is actually, it doesn't work that way. My experience is that it's more like uh, the right side, you know, is innovation, what I call innovation by accident. You know, you stumped into something interesting, somebody's interesting, you get lucky, uh, and uh, and off you go. Uh, can we do better than that? So, uh, you know, is there any way we can actually put a little bit of uh, organization and systems on, on this? Of course, this is not you. There are a whole department of management that worry about, you know, how to manage innovation and so on. So I don't pretend to to teach these people anything. I just you know, give some my own personal uh, experience on that. The first is really is uh, in regards the Center for Process System Engineering here at Imperial. It was probably when it started one of and for the you know, for many many years uh, the most accelerating uh, experience uh, I had. And I ask why was that? It goes down for me to three points. First, it was a kind of a long term horizon that he had for secure funding. When he started, it was a 10 year horizon. Here's a big pot of money. Go ahead and do your best with some exams uh, along. And what that enabled was to attract really, really good people. And you had somebody walking in because it was passing by through London and you had, a, you know, you really wanted they could hire him on the spot. Some of the people we hired that way, in fact, are still here you know, within the center today. Uh, the second thing is you could actually think program, not project, not a three year project that by the time you're halfway, you need to still think about you know, how do I fund the next one? And so you could actually think about what do I really want to do? Uh, and I have enough resources here to to go ahead and try to do it. Yeah. So let me do it. A name for a you know, real ambitious project. So that that I think was really a, a very exhilarating part of the uh, being in the center at, at the time of launching uh, and getting it going. The other uh, component I think is that the, the whole budget there for many years was uh, only 6% dedicated to the fundamental research, the PhD, the MSc, the usual stuff that we do in academia. The other 40% were dedicated to the stuff which is actually very difficult to do in academia is, you know, take a good idea from a PhD or two, package it in something which, which is usable that, that others can use so they can be tested in earnest by, you know, not the people who have developed it. And, um, they were, uh, and this uh, involved uh, hiring programmers, hiring people with you know, some management experience, uh, not the PhD type of you know, research. There were four, uh, five uh, of these major projects uh, started. Um, uh, I mentioned just uh, the batch processing project. I was uh, involved together in part with uh, Benile, uh, and there was the you know, G branch project that uh, Costa was involved. Uh, these were where really it all came together and, and enabled things to be taken to the stage where uh, you could go out and say, I now launch a spin off and do a, uh, set up a company because you had already done the very hard work of uh, you know, testing and validating essentially the method you know, uh, while before launching it, which is usually where you fail quite a lot. The third element you know, here, which uh, impinges on, on the second is you know, a very proactive uh, collaboration with industry. Uh, you can have a, a, your, your very good ideas about what the problems uh, might be, but they will tell you what the problems are. So if you are open minded, you can actually work, work together on something really, really interesting. Uh, and this was uh, implemented in, in a number of uh, ways, including the secondments uh, to and fro. Uh, uh, and uh, partnership of uh, great strength. And I'm happy to see you know, this industrial consortium, you know, which one of the aspects is still ongoing with great strength. Uh, we developed a number of things. I just uh, mentioned batch processing, which I was you know, 
mainly involved. You know, we looked at some very complicated process of integrating, you know, the entire process from uh, planning to all the way down to, you know, control and uh, execution of, of very large, uh, complex uh, projects. Uh, uh, great fun in uh, uh, scheduling uh, you know, beer and uh, tiramisu for Northern Europe and so on. You know, lots of very you know, complex, complicated problems. Uh, we were doing at that stage, you know, all this complex problem, you know, using some, uh, not optimizing, but using some heuristic, but you know, with great detail to, to the to the constraints and to the model and, and actually do it in online. So, you know, great stuff. I'm afraid 20 years ahead of our time, but I'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, 20 years later, I'm actually doing some of the same things now. Uh, this is something for the you know, real-time you know, control of uh, you know, refineries that uh, my you know, latest uh, PhD student has done you know, using uh, proper uh, optimization uh, uh, and uh, with, again with great success you know, using a nonlinear you know, uh, predicted control. You know, predicting and executing you know, schedules uh, online and taking into account of uh, uh, you know, changes in, uh, in uh, uh, set points in what you want to do and disturbances as you go along. You know, not only that, but you know, being able to say what is the best trade-off here between you know, a stable schedule and uh, uh, something which is optimal. So you need to change very frequent something uh, as opposed to something you, you change you know, only seldom. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of projects. You know, uh, time is flying here. Yeah, this is something we did within within the uh, the center, and um, is uh, process concept We call it Presto. Uh, my frustration with uh, trying to get things out fast uh, was there from the beginning. I must say it's not diminished. Uh, so one with thing we tried to put together was uh, you know, fast track projects, you know, three to six months, no more, for demoing in hunger and validating, you know, the, the stuff we were producing. You know, are they any good? Will they work or, or not? And what benefits? Uh, the, the, the key idea here was, you know, this is not going to do if we do it by ourselves. You know, we need to get people from industry together. We need to get not just the R&D friends, which were you know, here in the center doing, you know, doing PhD research two years early. We need to involve uh, people in the businesses, in the marketing, those who will be the eventual user of this. Uh, and this was a, uh, worked very well. Um, the, the outcome of this was to assess the potential in, in real application and to, to on one hand, to, to, to de define whether this whatever it presented was uh, real and effective, but also mainly to affect to, to, to identify benefits and bar it to introduction eventually, many of which are not technical, but really maybe organizational or maybe economic. Oh, we just got, uh, you know, Aspen Tech uh, two months ago. We are not going to change for the next five years uh, to something you know, different. So these barriers to introduction were, were really the key issue that came back and permeated a lot of further research. We did a, a dozen you know, projects, all highly successful. I'll just mention very, very quickly you know, two. One was you know, paints manufacturing. You know, this is, a, this is the, for car manufacturing. You, know, you, uh, uh, you may have a single plant making the, you know, the pink and the, uh, uh, and the blacks and the whites you know, uh, all in the same you know, play, uh, place. We had looked at uh, how you schedule production there with, with very great success. Uh, we would then looked at uh, what would be the best uh, design for this plant. Is it the conventional plant with all uh, product lines and so on? Will be a pipeless plant where you move uh, 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 unit operation around uh, to, uh, to various stations or will be you know, blending in, in, in camp. Uh, we, we look at that and you know, clearly the the solution was that you know, the, uh, the optimal was a combination of a conventional and, 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 and pipeless uh, plant. Uh, the outcome of this project, you know, because it was done together with the people who were the you know, users, was they, they canceled the $15 million, uh, million pounds project that they had already sanctioned. 
the CEO decided that you know no projects that of this uh, uh, type um, of uh, uh, you know, revamp implied will be done without this type of analysis. And they pinched our uh, lecturer, best lecturer, who had done part of the work, who went to work with them uh, as a measure of uh, you know, liking the product. Uh, so economic successful, you know, very successful in terms of uh, technology transfer as well. Uh, a second project, and I'll go very quickly now, is to do with the development of sequential control for, uh, again, for batch plant. Most of this is not a conventional continuous control. Is uh, if you do this, then you do that, and then uh, you know, when the temperature is high, then you switch over and so on. It's actually very difficult to do, and and it's not highly automated. Uh, we had developed as a part of our research, you know, one of my uh, students and uh, my team, uh, a, 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 some techniques for you know, demonstrably correct uh, generation of code and for translation into you know, documentation, uh, simulation and uh, company code and sequential control code as well. Uh, again, nobody believes it unless you are the modeler, so uh, we put together a a team where we, both the industrial experience team and us would work on the same problem and then we'll try to take each other's uh, results apart. Uh, first, you know, we found that uh, you know, our product was as good as the industrial control uh, product. Uh, we found you know, many errors in, in what had produced, some of which had safety implications. You know, uh, the R&D, uh, our product was uh, much more uh, heavy in terms of you know, specification up front, but then went very rapidly into the development, uh, generating a very large amount of project uh, of, co of savings in, in project costs, which are actually very tight. Uh, and for the company projecting very large amount of uh, you know, benefit. And I'll tell you in a minute, uh, you know, the this, this story for uh, what happened there. In fact, I may as well tell you that, tell you now. Uh, the the company uh, had lined up a whole you know, project team to take up both this technology and the super batch technology for uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the, uh, the 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 the, the, uh, um, the 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 super batch technology for for uh, organizing production was licensed to PSC. Uh, soon afterwards, you know, the company we were talking you know, to uh, got taken over. Our direct contact there, uh, you know, got moved on. Uh, connection lost. You know, end of end of the story. So uh, one of the lessons here: don't put more than one egg in in a single basket. Uh, I'll I'll take this very quickly. I think I only have a few minutes left. Uh, this is uh, essentially starting a new applied research center of the type of uh, uh, you know, CPSC, but with with colleagues in in Russia, in at the other end of Siberia. Uh, the funding was uh, from uh, both from BP and the uh, Skolkov Foundation in Russia. This came at the time when, for the Russian, working with the West was good and uh, trying to open up. Um, Russia had exceeded the G7, G7, become G8, and exceeded the world trade. So it was a, a good time. Uh, we worked uh, on a on a fast track on you know, the entire gamut, uh, putting together some of the best people people on both sides. One of the uh, one of the characteristics was that we tried to put in parallel to the technology development, the tech transferring identification and managing the dressing up and the, the testing and so on. And this worked very, very well. So much so that, uh, you know, in the end of a three year plan, we had you know, 22 you know, patents uh, applied and three spin offs you know, there to come back. Again, there is a you know, so exceptional success here. Uh, we got, uh, you know, the T-shirt and we got uh, uh, nominated for a research project, shortlist for the research project of the year. Uh, lots of uh, visibility, lots of publications. Uh, but uh, 
at, at, at the point where we're going to take off, uh, our, our friend Putin decided to invade you know, Crimea and so on. So uh, what was uh, uh, opening up became suddenly autarky. You know, the, the whole uh, thing went in deep freeze. Uh, some of, I know some of our colleagues in Russia are, are developing some of the ideas and pursuing the patents and the applications on our side. It became impossible. So again, you know, technology transfer is difficult. So I mentioned that. So uh, to summarize this, uh, I think that collaboration you know, doesn't happen, must be engineered. The same way that you can have a plan for research, you need to have a, 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 a plan and mechanism for uh, introducing engagement, uh, exchange, uh, exchange of data, demonstrations, but also to, to build the knowledge on both sides of what the real problems are and what the real application applicability might be. At the very early stage, because if you wait until the technology is ready, it's too late, you will wait another five years, much will go wasted. Okay. So, uh, a few minutes to conclude. Again, with no question. I'm, I'm in the position where I can allow to pontificate here from the back of my you know, experience. Where do I see this going next? Of course, the, the paradigm that Roger introduced, you know, integration is good. You need to understand you know, not just the components, but the, the, the connection between the system and then you optimize the lot is great. If you follow that, uh, will you, your system become ever bigger? Um, where do I see this going? Uh, I think you need to have some, some pointers there. For me, the you know, bigger, you know, geopolitical changes here are related are three. First, demography. Uh, 58 countries have already uh, passed their peak in, in uh, population. So, uh, and the projections are that by the end of the century, uh, the population growth will be approximately zero. Many of these people are, are already born. Okay, are already born and will live you know, that long. Uh, profound implications. Uh, so we're you know, really probably already past uh, you know, peak baby. Uh, profound implications on uh, you know, who is going to do the work, who is going to you know, support in you know, old age. Uh, if uh, industrial doesn't have much growth, is the growth going to be into the, uh, uh, the emerging countries? You know, is money going to follow? Uh, very complex uh, situation. The other, of course, is climate change. If you have been on this uh, planet lately, you, you will know. Uh, you know. For me, that goes hand in hand with biodiversity. Uh, I was flabbergasted to hear that uh, there are more tigers now in captivity in the US than there are wild in the rest of the world. And there are more about four and a half thousand uh, tigers. Uh, and you can mention other other as well. So are, are, are we going to be, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the causing of what uh, uh, an extinction similar to the uh, to the dinosaurs, including our own. Well, I think is uh, we need to react very quickly, and the challenge will be there is no capital enough at the moment to to do all the things we need to do yesterday. The third uh, fundamental change is technology. Things have, have changed so so much. You know, my first year in, in university, I was advised to buy a slide rule. Okay, because that was the uh, and what type was the, had better uh, um, accuracy than others. Um, and, and now my phone has more technology than than was in the Apollo mission that went to the moon by far. The slide, uh, the graph on the right shows that this is CO two emissions of digital application. I'm not sure where you can read. 
uh, but it's about uh, you know, 9% increase uh, and 4% um, uh, projected increase in, 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 in uh, CO2 emission from digital applications. So why everybody says, yes, digitalization is great, so on, are we, is digital the new plastics? Uh, so there will be profound implication posed by you know, the rate and type of uh, technology development. I think we need to work uh, differently. Uh, of course, continue to do very good fundamental uh, R&D, but I hope that we'll do more of this goal-based targeted projects using very much wider collaborative teams. Uh, in one example is uh, the activity that Imperial College here is, is doing, you know, with the white city, having you know, what they call spin in, you know, uh, shared space for co-location for, uh, for working with industry and various consultancy design. Uh, Imperial X, uh, you know, one of the plants just announced to, to in fact look at uh, application of AI, uh, Bring, bringing together 500 researchers from engineering, natural science, uh, medicine, and, and business school. You know, I think it's only administration that's left uh, uh, left out. Uh, again, this is one of the things that's been doing locally. Many others have been done elsewhere. Uh, I think technology demonstration is really, really, really good way of learning on, on real system. We have here uh, Instrumented our control room uh, pilot plant with uh, with state of the art uh, facility from ABB. They are coming. There are people who are coming here to see how we are doing things. A very good way to interact. Similar system in electrical engineering for power uh, uh, digital power control. You know, we could do a lot more of that. A lot of uh, stuff has been done on the. Uh, evolving, uh, assessing the, the state of relationship and so on. The, the trends says geographical proximity remains important. For me, <laughs> that means uh, uh, also the the drinks, the chats, the the bumping uh, elbow, not not just to keep people apart, but to uh, to to have discussion. So I hope that uh, you know, resumes uh, very soon, and we can do more on that. I, I would not. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, I think we're already quite wide. Uh, we need to go wider yet, both in terms of the scales from uh, you know, really molecular to, uh, to, to, to global scale. There uh, will be a wealth of new sensors coming along. Um, uh, it will be clearly automation of everything and net zero. Uh, you know, this is already happening. It's not a crystal ball here. I think that we will need to include much more uh, strongly behavior as a part of the processes. You look at COVID, you know, technical issues are, are the easy bit, you know, the people issues are, are a hard one, but that has always been the case in, in control of process plant. I think you know, we need to reflect this in much you know, wider measures of you know, performance, you know, including uh, uh, the, the you know, well-being. Uh, resiliency, I think, will be very, very important, uh, and uh, you already do that. But you know, I don't think we are we really know how to deal the you know, very improbable but very high uh, impact uh, events, and how to rejig supply chains, plant designs, whatever. In this communication, yes, you know, because things become much more difficult, we need to to work much harder in trying to. You know, communicate with the rest of the people who will need our technology. Finally, I think, uh, uh, given that we will want to do everything, you know, retaining an identity that will be a challenge. I never believe that process system engineering is part of uh, chemical engineering. I, I always thought the other way around, uh, because my view of processes has always been quite wide, but that's an open question. Maybe we can have some discussion. No doubt. I think we will have you know, more engineering, more system, more processes, both in the analysis and in the synthesis sense, uh, making uh, Rogers uh, 
uh, kind of vision, you know, even more challenging. And uh, I'm, in a way, I'm sorry I'm not coming in at this stage because things are looking very interesting. So many thanks for your attention. We'd be happy to answer queries or have uh, you know, discussed it later. Thank you, Thank Sandra, you. for uh, this wide-ranging talk. Um, it was really great to see um, the connection between data and uh, um, models that you showed in process systems engineering, but also to see how that uh, extends to applications, and you showed some really impressive applications there. Um, so we can't applaud you, but on behalf of, of everyone here, uh, thank you again for uh, sharing your thoughts on this and your experience. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll move straight to the panel discussion. You stay on for the panel, Sandro, so there'll be an opportunity to ask uh, questions there as well. Um, while I'm making introductions, I'd encourage members of the audience to uh, post questions in the Q&A. Um, so I'm really delighted to introduce uh, our moderator for this um, a panel discussion, which will be on the questions, question of whether we still need physics-based models. Um, so our moderator is uh, Mehmet Merkangos. Mehmet is a reader at the Sargent Center. He joined us about nine months ago uh, from ABB, where he spent uh, 14 years. Um, most recently, he was technical manager for artificial intelligence in uh, ABB Future Labs. And his research interests are, are in the area of uh, autonomous industrial systems. So he's eminently suited to uh, animate this uh, discussion. Mehmet, over to you. Thank you very much, Claire. I want to welcome everyone in our audience to this uh, panel session. Uh, also a warm welcome to our panelists. In addition to Professor Sandro Macchietto, we have three guests this evening. Uh, Dr. Christiana Lara, a senior research scientist at Amazon. Um, her research focuses on modeling and algorithms for large scale discrete optimization with applications in supply chains and logistic networks. We have Dr. Francisco Navarro, uh, industrial data scientist at Solway. He has a background in modeling and simulation, and he is currently working on solving optimization and process engineering problems. And finally, we have uh, Professor Karen Wilcox. She is a professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics, as well as the director of the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. So welcome to all of you. Uh, as uh, Claire mentioned, the title of our panel session this evening is a question. It's do we still need physics based models? And this question is probably something provocative for some people, depending on their background or the area they are working in. And for some others, it could be actually uh, some uh, a very fair question to ask. Uh, so, although it does not explicitly say it, it's quite obvious that it refers to data-driven models as the alternative to physics-based models. And uh, as Sandro was uh, alluring to it uh, in his talk, uh, we are seeing developments like the AlphaFold uh, program from DeepMind for predicting protein structure. Uh, so important breakthroughs using machine learning that they could be considered for uh, a Nobel Prize even. Uh, so data-driven methods are of course not new and they were widely used also in the past, but indeed we see this accelerating trend in the last uh, six, seven years. So my first question to our panelists uh, will be on uh, how they would predict from their observations in their own fields the future role of machine learning. How do they think this trend will continue into the future? And I want to start uh, this discussion uh, by inviting uh, first uh, Professor Karen Wilcox to respond uh, to this question. Thank you. Please, Karen, go ahead. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Mehmet. Uh, so, what is the, what is the future role of machine learning in uh, maybe I'll speak as an as an engineer and. Um, like you said, the title of the panel, do we still need physics-based models is quite pr provocative. And I, I would say um, in terms of thinking of the future role of machine learning, if, if your going in point is that it's going to replace physics-based learning, then you're in for uh, physics-based modeling, then you're in for a big disappointment because I think the answer to that question is a resounding no. And that when we you know, hear people making claims that um, machine learning is able to learn and uh, make predictions for very complex dynamics. The notion that that will be instead of our physics-based models, I think, is really wrong. 
There are many reasons why that's the case, but just to draw on one is, of course, these machine learning models need to be trained. And the question is, where does the data come from? And as Sandro has given us you know, sort of a very nice view in, in uh, one aspect, uh, acquiring data is very difficult and complex in engineering systems. And I believe we will never, never have the amount of data to be able to re rely on the data alone. Uh, the data are, are almost always indirect. As engineers, we can never actually measure what it is we're trying to get at. Uh, the data are noisy and uh, the data are almost always sparse, both in space and, space and time. So machine learning won't replace physics-based modeling. Of course, it does have an important role to play as yet another toolbox in the tools of, in the hands of modelers and uh, engineers, designers, decision makers. Um, there is an important class of problems for which we don't have good models, and I believe that we'll see an increased use of machine learning to tackle those kinds of problems. That's true in, uh, for example, many of the biological sciences. Uh, there are many problems where we do have good models, but uh, there are many uncertain parameters that need to be characterized or learned uh, for those models. Machine learning certainly has a role to play there, although again, we need to keep in mind that this is long been called an inverse problem or the problem of data assimilation. And so there are methods that have long histories uh, in, in many fields of engineering of, of weather forecasts. So thinking about how machine learning will play into that. And then uh, finally, the, the third area where I see machine learning is when you do have uh, physics-based models and simulations, but they're very, very expensive. And I know there's a lot of excitement around training machine learning models that then replace those simulations and uh, provide answers much faster. And again, I think that's an important and exciting area. But again, I would point out that this is something that engineers and computational scientists have been doing for decades in the area of surrogate modeling, reduced order modeling. And so again, I see machine learning as uh, a sort of a complementary set of tools to those things we have. So uh, in the range of spectrum, disappointment if you think that machine learning is going to have all the answers, but a lot of excitement and opportunities when we think of it in concert of the very powerful uh, other tools that we have. Very interesting, very interesting. Francisco, would you like to respond to uh, this question as well? So what is your, your opinion in the in the further development of the role of machine learning when it comes to engineering, um, medicine uh, and applications in the general fields of sciences? Now you can hear me probably. Yes, now we can hear you. Yeah, yeah it was frozen for a second. Um, yeah, I think, I think the answer already is pretty complete. I, I will I will maybe put some context on my experience because I work in a chemical company in a manufacturing side. So we have the privilege of having data from the process itself. We have many sensors. And um, but we have to keep in mind that as, as we're saying, machine learning is not something new. It's an extension of what they have been doing uh, for, for a few years in chemical engineering uh, and process system engineering. So, you know, we, we have all of us studied that was this regression and uh, or classification of flow maps or say that. And these are forms of machine learning, but we didn't call them machine learning, right? And therefore, um, what I have to say, though, is this this um, this technology and this amount of data we're putting available in the hands of process engineers is making, in my opinion, uh, the need of having more and more formation on the new tools and new new capacities. Because while it's not going to substitute uh, the domain knowledge, and in fact, it's going to require domain knowledge, um, we have to be aware that there is a much faster way today to find anomalies or a much faster way to find things that are correlated to the problem where we, we want to solve. And, uh, and, and Oops, I think you are um, again on mute. Francisco, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I yes, think sir. I see you, you, you have the, you, you are unmuted now, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know why it's, hap it's happening. Um, yes, as I was saying that even Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yes, to conclude, the 
the the importance of machine learning is not to ignore it. Uh, uh, domain knowledge is needed, but the capabilities they are developing and the amount of data that is in front of us will make us go to go much faster. I see. I see. Christiana, what about you? What's your perspective on the role of machine learning? Do you see an increasing trend, the similar trend continuing, or do you see a disillusionment, maybe a little bit like how Karen was also alluding to it? What is your opinion on this? Um, I think it will stabilize. There is a lot of hype uh, right now, but I, as, as Karen was saying, I see it as more of a complementary tool to the physics-based model than something that will completely replace it. Uh, and coming from my, my field specifically, like working with planning, uh, you can get a lot of information from data, uh, but you can only learn what you've already observed in the past with the, the historical data that you have. So if you're trying to, for example, like when you're designing a supply chain, change the way that you do things, you need the physics based models, like first principle type of models, either to like simulate the system or optimize it. And then eventually you can do something like Karen was saying that uh, you can learn from the results of the uh, physics based model and then have a machine learning on top of that to have it faster. Uh, but I don't see a way of getting away with first principle models for extrapolation, for decision making, and also also interpretability uh, to, to be able to understand what are the key variables that like how are they impacting? Because a lot of times that yes, yeah, the sensitivity analysis is as important as the plan itself that it's coming out, out of it. I'm I'm afraid I'm also not able to hear Christiana neither. Uh, is that a oh, delay? You or? didn't. He can you hear me? Yes. Now now I can hear you. Do okay. you have to so, fight it that off? <laughs> did you hear anything? <laughs> I heard. Did I heard you hear most, anything that I most said? Most of it we heard. You were talking about sensitivities of, of your solutions and how important they are. Yes, and yeah, so that was the end. And then like the sensitivity sometimes is as important as the plan itself. So you can understand because models are limited and there are a lot of approximations. So getting to understand how the, the different variables impact in the final plan are, are very important too. And you can get that out of uh, data, purely data driven models. So Sandro, I see here really a very strong opinion forming, uh, really praising physics based models. Uh, what, what is your what is what is your intuition uh, for the future? Do you expect alpha fold like uh, achievements uh, accumulating and really the importance of machine learning may be rising or do you think this is already sort of the peak and uh, it's going to maybe not have as many replications of similar achievements? I think the answer is yes and yes. You need everything that you can get because you know, problems are very difficult. Um, uh, I, I think there is a little bit of nomenclature here, you know, bandwagons. You know, people talk about data driven uh, uh, models or whatever type. What's the alternative? Ignorance driven model or opinion driven model? You know, every model is uh, driven by data or should be driven by data or you know uh, the other thing is uh, uh, physics model physics is just an encapsulation of uh, you know lots of data you know call it if you don't like it physics model call it surrogate model of reality <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah, that's what they are and they've been validated over many years supported by theories and you know many experiments so so, so so the mass balance you know, should hold is 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 a surrogate model of uh, you know simply stuff. So if you do that, you, you start getting things together. The other things which I I, I suspect, and I, I must say I don't know enough of that, but I have the impression that a lot of the machine learning is just PR rebudging of statistics. Okay. On the other hand, if you go to anybody or get funding for some statistics or you try to get uh, a student to work on a statistics based uh, new method, yeah, you, you will go down like a lead balloon. Nobody likes statistics except the statisticians. So 
you know, if this is a, a, another way of getting the same results, fine. You know, I'm, I'm all for it. I think that you know, there are some problems which might be more amenable than others. If you say, OK, uh, if you bought this, you will also like that. That's statistics uh, and you know, there is no model there, so that's perfectly valid there. Uh, and I think that uh, you know, many, um, as I indicated in my, in my talk, many uh, uh, you know, interpolation problems will, will work beautiful because now we can process much, much more data. Generating knowledge out of this you know, is, is the difficult bit. And I should, do, I should use whatever you have, you know, whether it's from past data encapsulated in physics or whether from uh, you know, throwing in uh, you know, learning. So Sandro, actually uh, two things I want to follow up from, from your presentation. Uh, maybe the first one is you were mentioning again uh, on this alpha fold example that it already has a lot of uh, physics or existing knowledge. Let, let's call it knowledge or know-how uh, embedded in it. So it's not a pure end-to-end -end machine learning or only data-driven uh, approach. So it has this knowledge that's also encapsulated with it. And we also see a lot of other similar approaches being very successful, like these physics-informed neural networks and, and so on in, in different engineering applications. Maybe in, in the second round, I, I'd like to ask the uh, panelists, um, what they what they think about this hybrid approach and if, if this is established or if they see any, any challenges in, in, in or any imbalance that could uh, that could actually uh, emerge in, in the future. So let me pose this again to, to Karen to start with. So you're, ask, you're asking about uh, challenges for some of the approaches that blend machine learning with physics based modeling? We see this success that these hybrid approaches were, which really combine uh, both knowledge and somehow machine learning uh, in an integrated fashion are, are being very successful. And if you give also AlphaFold as an example going in that direction, do, is it the consensus that this will be the way of the future or if it, this was already uh, how it was uh, in, in, in the past applications as well? Do you see this as, a, as being established as actually the, the path forward? I do think it's the way of the future, but like Sandro said, this is the way of the past too. <laughs> and maybe the difference is that now we have more sophisticated algorithms and uh, more sophisticated computers as well that let us do these same things, which is just like Sandro said, drawing together domain knowledge, data, postulating models that are representations of reality. We have a new set of tools um, you know, I think so far we've all been quite critical of machine learning, but let's not forget that the power of a neural network representation is that it lets you map many inputs to many outputs in a scalable way that most other uh, functional approximations do not let you do. So again, um, I think the, the notion that we are bringing together data and we have more data, in investing, uh, injecting that with our domain knowledge and our models is not new. Um, what I, I guess what, what I fear is that there are many people who seem to think, first of all, that it is new, uh, but second of all, that, that, and just again, as Christiana said, that we need to think of it as a replacement. Uh, so, you know, the, the challenges and opportunities I, I see, for example, uh, let's pick inverse problems, the field of inverse problems. That's the task of learning for, from data for a complex system, uh, for example, governed by partial differential equations. It's what brings us weather forecasts every day, data assimilation, inverse problems. It's what's driven uh, the oil and gas industry. So as we uh, start to think about those opportunities, Mehmet, and what machine learning can bring, let's not forget everything that we've learned in the last few decades about uh, particularly the ill-posed nature of, of an inverse problem with sparse data, um, how to design scalable algorithms that that actually uh, will tackle the partial differential equations where the parameters are, are spatially distributed and, and, and so on. So yes, it is the way of the future, but it's also uh, got to bring together more communities than just than, than, than just one. I see, I see your point. The, I think uh, in, in some ways uh, I, I could imagine that there will be um, 
particularly on the academic side, the, there is uh, the interest to answer the why question. So we are interested really to understand how things are, are working. Uh, but maybe on the industry side, there could be uh, a more utility based look on some of these solutions. So if we had this imaginary case that we could have uh, perfect black box models, so we can generate predictions with very high accuracy, uh, but we don't necessarily will know uh, how they are functioning or how they are uh, coming up with those predictions. So I want to ask to our panelists from the from the industry, will this be, let's say, the solution to all, all their problems or do they still see even in the industry and a, a necessity to answer maybe a why question? So let me pose it uh, to Francisco first. Yeah, thanks. It's a good question. Um... I think it depends on the industry. In a chemical industry, for sure, a black box model where you don't understand what is behind is too risky. Uh, risky for operations, risky for environment, or risky for life threatening. Eh? So, um, but it's true that we we can start looking at the data and get uh, basically black box models. But today there is a lot of uh, you know explainable AI algorithms to to also open those boxes and and see what is inside. Eh? And, and these are useful to get started. Eh? Uh, and, but often what happens when we do these models, like simple, you know, through the data, see what happens. We get either an obvious answer, so you obvious to a domain expert, eh, to a process engineer, uh, or a wrong answer because we have done a, a bad split of the data. Uh, so for maybe other industries where there is not so high, high risk, you can be more, uh, you know, risk adverse, but in, in, in chemical industries, uh, we, we need to see this uh, always what is inside of these black boxes. Uh, otherwise, it's too, uh, people on, on the side will not be able to, to verify the, what is happening. And Christiana, what about you? If you had the perfect black box model, would you still ask for something that you can look inside? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, uh, so black box that in a way you can't really see, uh, get the, the reasoning behind it. It's very complicated to convince people that the results make sense. Um, and also to validate it, like you can test, but you usually have a, a limited uh, data set. So it is important to, to make sure at least that it's matching like the general intuition. So even if you stick with machine learning models, uh, going into interpretability and trying to understand if you selected the right features and if the, like uh, with and then how the features are impacting the the solution of the model. Uh, and there has been a lot of research in, the, in that area uh, with, uh, and then like using things like partial dependency plots. Those things are important. Um, to convince like business partners, for example, that the results of the models make sense and that it's worth investing in that and putting that into production. So I think uh, regardless of physics based models or just sticking with data driven, it's important to uh, not treat this as a complete black box and understand the relationships and behaviors. Yes, I think very, very interesting points on this trust uh, on, on these algorithms is, is a very interesting point. I saw Sandro raising raising his finger. Um, I'm going to give you the next question, Sandro. You can you can decide to add your, your response to this one, uh, but let me let me actually bring this up. Your your uh, last, let's say, slide which showed the population, uh, let's say projections, um, and you asked who is going to do the work. And uh, obviously my, my research is on autonomous systems and I, I am sometimes feeling guilty about it that I'm, I'm building things that could maybe even be replacing jobs. Uh, but nevertheless, um, the other thing that that's that's happening and I see many people complaining about this is this machine learning hype is raising this um, trend that students are very interested in machine learning and maybe some other fields of study are not seeing the same attention not not as much let's say time and effort are, are being put in advancing the, the other fields. So um, 
is there a possibility of a, a loss of knowledge actually and that with the decline of populations and so on do we see this sort of clashing trends that should we depend more on automation and more on let's say data driven or ai like systems uh, and or should you really strive to actually educate also people in other areas so how would you how would you think um, what's your perspective on this uh, yeah i think uh, to some to some extent uh, uh, these, these are you know, very big problems you know in the chemical industry you know already now you have a, a big problem because a lot of the you know expert uh, operators are uh, you know going out uh, and so, uh, you know, how do you replace them? How do you do that? Uh, on the other hand, you know, we 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 don't need as many people now to tune our cars because they get tuned themselves uh, 250 times a second uh, by you know, the technology. So, you know, if you have a problem with your car, you go out, open your wallet, three thousand pounds, change the management system. OK, because nobody will even look inside of whether or, or, or whether you know, a little uh, element has, has been burned or not. You trade off one problem for, for another. I think that um, um, you know, it's, it's good that you work on uh, autonomous system. They will pay your pension. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good one. Karen, I wanted to also direct this question to you. Yeah. Yeah, um, maybe I, it is. It is a worry. It's a worry to me um, because I think the future of the world is going to depend on on many things, but certainly on people who have deep domain knowledge in science, engineering, and medicine. And you know, you mentioned the problem of of uh, students being attracted to machine learning. I guess I would I would elevate that to a, a higher level. The problem is there's too much to learn. There's too much to teach in the four years we have available for an undergraduate degree and then however many years you want to spend in your, your graduate degree and uh, you know as for example as an aerospace engineer we have to make decisions in our curriculum because we can't be putting students out into the world who are not skilled in computing and data and statistics and machine learning but if we're going to add these things into the curriculum in a meaningful way, we have to take things out. And then, you know, what do you want to take out? Fluid dynamics, structures, controls, propulsion. Uh, I mean, this is this is not a this is not a viable choice. So I uh, I really think that you know we the academics in partnership with industry and with with government need to be rethinking um, education and what it means what it means to educate across this range of of disciplines. Uh, and it's it's a really it's a really tough question, but but it does worry me for sure. So we are coming uh, uh, slowly to the end of our end of our session, and um, I want to ask uh, uh, Christina uh, a question on actually um, where do they say see let's say where, where do you see Christina the uh, let's say the next frontiers for for development considering your own activities where do you expect let's say uh, both from from the influence of machine learning as well. Uh, how what do you let's say what do you wait for? What do you think will be something that, that could uh, change the the way you are approaching your problems? One exciting area there has been some research on is the using machine learning uh, combined with discrete optimization. So uh, using machine learning to learn branching roles to help like to basically help with the algorithm such that it's more uh, targeted to the specific type of problems. Uh, I think that there is a lot of potential in, in that area. Uh, so in that case, you keep your uh, first principles based model, but the, the, uh, the solver behind it has some learning capabilities that based on some features of your problem can solve it faster. Um, but th there is a lot. There's a lot of different areas like uh, reinforcement learning. Um, it's it's an area that has been attracting more more attention and then there you you learn the policy. So it's different from, from like just machine learning for uh, like a specific prediction or classification. Uh, it's actually more related to decision making. I also think that there is a lot of that's going to come from that area. Um, yeah, but I'll leave for the others to come. Uh, to give their I, opinions on this. If, if I may interject. 
Uh, yeah, just very brief. OK, OK. Yeah, uh, I think the it's not it's not quite clear how um, you know the the, the, the fold uh, you know, programs work, but one of the things that they say is they they mimic the way people solve puzzles and they introduce a way of doing that. So that that tunes in with what you're mentioning. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question or we had one question. Now I see a second question popping up actually in the in, in the chat. Um, I wanted to give Francisco actually the chance to, to respond, um, uh, but uh, let me look here. The first question appears to be more of a comment rather than a question. Actually, it's a, it's a pers it's I think putting together the validation um, aspect. Um, there is a, another question which also came in. Would you like to respond to the last question, Francisco? Yes, how yes, to yes. jointly approach the challenge of AI democratization? Yes, how do you see maybe the, if we take this question and, and look at it a bit uh, in your in your own, let's say, sector, uh, Francisco, is, is access to AI uh, solutions a challenge? Do you see this, let's say, becoming also maybe a ch uh, let's say competitive uh, problem in certain cases, particularly maybe with, with certain companies being too strong in this area? Is this something you would you would see as a, as a challenge, as an issue? Yes, yes, the, the question comes from another chemical company, right? So uh, the, the, it's a really challenging because it, it's like people are very busy. Eh? So where how, where do you make room for more training? And the answer I'm, I'm trying to follow is I'm trying to show them uh, how to using this tool, they can save time. Because as I said, uh, you can look at the data and find anomalies very quickly, or you can ask a question to the data and find correlation uh, or factors that are correlated, and that saves a lot of time. And 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 when you show that, uh, uh, when you democratize how to solve problems and not you know tools like uh, let me talk about neural networks, right, or, or or random forest, you just say okay, let me show you how to. Uh, solve problems quicker, huh? production issues quicker. That is the, the best way I found to, to democratize. And uh, on top of, of, of course, fight with the um, IT challenges that uh, arise, uh, licensing issues, data quality issues. So it's from the top uh, managers to convince that we can do, uh, you know, show examples huh? uh, and from, from chemical engineers and to, to people on the shop floor, how to help them by using the data, and that's how I, I think we can do the most uh, quickly. Thank you very much. So um, we have actually approached or passed the, the time allocated for our panel session. Uh, this is a very interesting topic, also dear to my heart. Uh, it's a, I, I think we will find other, other venues where we can continue discussing, I think for the sake of adhering to the program for the moment. I'd like to thank all the participants in our panel or all our panelists. Thank you very much. And I hand it back to Claire uh, for the time being. Thank you. Thank you, Mehmet, and uh, thank you to all the panelists for your contributions. I think we took what was indeed a provocative question to start with, but we got some very deep uh, answers uh, beyond the simple uh, yes that I think everybody agreed on on the panel. Um, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, posed a lot of questions for us to to pursue in our own research going forward. Uh, so thank you so much for, for this uh, uh, very educational evening. I'd also like to thank uh, Sandro for, for his lecture again, um, which really did bring together some of uh, Professor Charles Sargent's uh, dearest um, interest in terms of, of looking at the fundamentals and driving those to application. So thank you, Sandro, and uh, I do hope that we, we get a chance to celebrate this in person as well uh, in the near future. And thank you all to all the attendees for joining us tonight. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you.